you open your Bibles this morning and turn with me please to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We'll be beginning in verse 1. Exodus chapter 20. Beginning in verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have any gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above, or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's sin to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will punish anyone who misuses his name. Remember to dedicate the Sabbath day. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the foreigner who is within your gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Let's pray. Father God, we remember that you are our model for what a father is to be. And Father, I ask you this morning to help me to say what needs to be said. Help us to see the parts that apply to our lives. Lord, I pray that your work will work in our lives and our hearts this morning. Please open our eyes and our ears and give us understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A newspaper editor decided... He would print one of the Ten Commandments in his paper every day for ten consecutive days. At the completion of including the Ten Commandments, a reader wrote in and said, Cancel my subscription. Your paper is getting too personal. We're going to get very, very personal this morning and in the remaining weeks ahead of us as we continue to study the Ten Commandments. Because we are coming to those commandments that have to do with our relationships with one another. You remember the Ten Commandments were given to God, given by God to Moses on tablets of stone. And those two tablets remind us that these commandments have to do with two vital relationships. First of all, man's relationship to God. That's the first four commandments. Second of all, man's relationship to his fellow man. And that's the final six commandments. Jesus summed them up this way. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And the second is under the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Two tablets. Of course, we know that these two come together. You can't be right with your fellow man if you're not right with God. And if you are right with God, then you are in a position to be right with your fellow man. The Lord Jesus summarized them. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. These two great sections of the Ten Commandments tie together. They belong together. Our relationship to God and our relationship to one another. They also tie together religion and morality. For you cannot have true morality without a true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This past Thursday I attended a meeting where the people there were discussing the importance of church and state being connected and what a difficulty we run into and what serious issues we face if Christianity is ever taken out of government. I certainly applaud that. Many people recognizing that we need to return to teaching of some kind of values and morals in our school. And by the way, I'm grateful for those Christians 
who are taking a stand in our schools today, the Christian teachers and administrators who are doing the best they can within the limitations placed upon them to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. I applaud their efforts. Really, we are assigning our schools an impossible task. For you cannot teach morality apart from religion. I remember when I was in college studying business and management, I had to take a class on business ethics. Well, my friends, people do not understand that ethics and morality are inseparably connected. That morality is to be based on religion. And that apart from their religious foundation, every man can do what every society says is acceptable. And so we have kicked Bible reading out of our schools, and then we kicked prayer out of our schools, and we've made it almost impossible to teach morals. For there is no morality apart from religion. You cannot teach right from wrong apart from the standards that are revealed in the Word of God. For it is God's word that shows us what is absolutely right and wrong. Religion is our relationship to God. Morality, our relationship to others based upon our relationship to God. Another thing that you will notice is that in these Ten Commandments, God has given, that they are given in crystal clear, simple, easy to understand language. Thou shalt not kill. Not all that difficult. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Not all that difficult a concept to understand. And in this passage of scripture we're facing today, honor thy father and the mother. Not lengthy, not stretched out, not expanded, not that difficult to understand. When, when God went to say something, he got to the point. He didn't beat around the bush. When you read the Ten Commandments, you will find that God gives moral absolutes. And in a few words in these commandments, God establishes acceptable human behavior. Not only for that day, and not only for our day, but for all time and for all eternity. Now notice if you will, this commandment applies first to children. Honor your father and your mother. Honor your parents. You treat them with respect. Now we can look at this commandment largely in two different time scales, two different periods in our life. First, the commandment to younger children. Honor your parents. And that commandment, that honor is marked with first obedience. Alright, we're going to split right down the middle here. Russ and Eric and Christina, y'all are this side. Willie, y'all are this side. Um, on this side, look up Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1, please. Over on this side, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20. This is the audience participation portion of this service. Ephesians chapter 6. Someone over here, please read verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and your mother, which is the first commandment of his promise, that, they, that it may go well with thee, and thou mayest live long with the earth. Thank you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. This side, someone over here, please. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well with thee. Both of these verses emphasize the importance of children obeying their parents. That's not very popular in our society anymore. The media and many in our government want to make children independent and self-governing people at earlier and earlier ages. This lack of obedience and respect is illustrated in many of the TV programs on our, uh, on our TV today. We show the parents as being doddering fools and imbeciles while the children are depicted as being wise and understanding, knowing all things. The Bible says that children are to obey their parents. And they are to do that for several reasons. One, parents stand in the place of God. And by that I don't mean that parents are God. I don't mean to imply anything like that. I don't mean that parents are to take the place of our relationship with God. I don't mean anything like that. 
But to, for, to a certain extent, for younger children, parents model some of the functions that God does. Parents lay down the law. Parents give structure to what is right and wrong. Parents give limits to their children. Parents guide their children. And parents provide punishment and discipline when their commands, when their rules are not followed by their children. And in that way, parents are modeling for their children how they are to respond and, re and to respect God. Children are to obey their parents because they stand in the place of God. Teaching their children right from wrong. Second, children are to obey their parents because parents generally want the best for their children. Many of you parents have sacrificed vacations, new cars, the things that you would like to do for your children. You have sacrificed time in front of the TV set at night. You have sacrificed hours and hours of sleep at night trying to finish papers and science fair projects the night before they're due. Why? Because you want the best for your children. Unless a parent is ate up with sin or morally deranged, children are to obey their parents because their parents stand in the place of God for them. Second, parents want the best for their children. And so children will benefit by obeying their parents. Third, children are to obey their parents because Jesus did. Now, think about for a moment, if you will, who Jesus is. The Bible says that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is without beginning, He is without end. The Bible tells us in the book of John that Jesus is equal with God, that He was God. In the book of John, I'm sorry. The book of John also tells us that Jesus created all things. And that apart from Jesus, not a thing in the world was created. All things were made by Him. And yet this all-knowing, all-powerful, eternal creator God took upon Him the flesh of a man and was born as a babe in a manger in Bethlehem when he was coming of age, a teenager. Or in Jewish society, becoming recognized as a man 12 years old. And I hope my 12-year-old son is not here. Don't tell him that's the coming of age. 12 years old, Jesus' parents, Mary and Martha, took Jesus to Jerusalem to the temple. When the parents left and the party that they were traveling with, Jesus stayed behind in the temple. He was just becoming, coming to an awareness of the, the mission and the ministry perhaps that God had sent him for. Beginning to get a picture of what he was supposed to be doing here. And in the midst of that, he was sitting in the temple teaching all the religious folks. His parents three days out discovered he was missing and returned to the temple looking for him. They didn't have any amber alerts back then. They returned to Jerusalem running here and there trying to find their son. They found him at the temple. They said, man, what in the world are you doing? Don't you know that we've been worried about you? Jesus said, don't you know that I need to be about my father's business? But when they left, Jesus left with them. Jesus submitted to the authority, the will, the direction of his parents. The Bible says that he grew in stature and favor with God and man. Young people, children are to obey their parents because Jesus modeled it as well. Our relationship with our parents in our younger years, our formative years, is largely marked by obedience. In our older years, we have new commitments. We're moving out of the home. Establishing homes and families of our own. We are becoming a new entity when we get married. The Bible said the two become one flesh. And by the way, husbands, when you get married, your wife takes priority over your mom. Ladies, when you get married, your spouse takes priority over your parents. When you move out, when you get married, the relationship with parents changes. 
Now, it does not mean that we quit honoring our parents, but the obedience factor is not quite the same. When we reach the older days and the older years, our primary allegiance becomes to our spouse, and so honoring tends more toward reverencing our parents. And that means several things. One, it means that you speak kindly to your parents, even as adults. You're to be polite and respectful, speaking kindly to your parents, and also speaking kindly of your parents. Now, some of y'all, I know your parents are downright sorry. And you didn't have the best parents in the world. You weren't blessed like I was. But you still, as much as possible, in the eyes of those around you, to look for the good. To build up your parents, to speak kindly to them and kindly of them. But honoring your parents as adults also means that you provide for them. Save your places, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 15 and verse 3. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 3. He answered them, And why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and the one who speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, whoever tells his father or mother whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple. He does not have to honor his father. In this way you have revoked God's word because of your tradition. Hypocrites! Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commands of man. Jesus' understanding of the commandment to honor your father and mother included children providing for their parents in their older years. Making sure that they have a roof over their head. Making sure that they have something to eat. Making sure that your parents are able to get to the doctor when they need to. Honoring your parents as adults means that you respect them. You speak kindly to them. Speak kindly of them. It means that you make provision for them, taking care of them in their elder years. And you also honor your parents in the way that you live. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, speaking of our Heavenly Father, He said, Do your works in such a way that they may see them and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, part of the way that we are to live our lives, or part of the reason that we live our lives the way that we do as Christians, is so that what? Our Heavenly Father will receive praise from the world because of the way that we live, and the way that we act, and the way that we speak. The same is true of our earthly parents. We are to live our lives in such a way that our lives our lifestyle, our priorities, our efforts and energies reflect well on our parents, bringing honor and glory and respect to them. Because you know to a certain extent, your parents get a degree of, of recognition from your accomplishments and from how well you do. I remember the, the three old ladies talking in a nursing home and one of them was bragging my son is a doctor has a great nursing staff people are there all the time he makes several hundred thousand dollars a year second lady not to be outdone said well my son is an attorney he wins these massive cases and suits across the country he makes millions of dollars a year the third lady said, well, that's nothing. My son is a preacher and he makes so much money it takes four men to bring in the plates each Sunday morning. <laughs> Parents like to reflect in the glow of the accomplishments of their children. And when you do a good job at work, when you take care of your family, when you live moral lives, upstanding lives, you bring honor and glory not only to your heavenly father but to your earthly parents as well. The Bible says honor your father and your mother. You do that by treating them kindly with respect. You do that by providing for them and you do that also in the way that you live 
your lives. Now, this congregation this morning is primarily made up of adults and to a certain extent parents. So what should we do? One of our primary responsibilities is to become the type of parent that makes it easy for our children to respect us. To be the type of parent that it is easier for our children to honor. To become the kind of parent your children can honor. And you do that in several ways. First, parents love your children. Love your children. Touch them. One of the ways to express your love for your children is by touching them. Remember the prodigal son when he squandered all of his inheritance. In riotous living, the Bible describes it in a foreign land. He finally came to his senses and he rushed home. What was the first thing his daddy did? First he ran to him and then he hugged him. Oh, meaningful touch means so much to your children. Touch your children. Hug your children. Chuck Swindoll. Chuck Swindoll has said many a young woman who opts for immoral sexual relationship does so because she can scarcely remember a time when her father so much as touched her. Dads, wrestle with your children. Hug your children. Even when they become teenagers, hug your children. The, the boys will make a fuss. The girls will try to push it off. You're embarrassing them, but inside they really want it. I remember taking Drew to school. Fifth grade, his last year of elementary school. He went to get out of the car. I said, come here and kiss me. He said, what? I said, lean back over here in his car and kiss me. He made a face. I said, look, you know me. If you do not kiss me, I will get out of this car, chase you down, and kiss you in front of all of your friends. He leaned back in the car and kissed me. Now, why do I hug on the kids around here? And why do I kiss the top of their heads? Kids need to be touched. They need to be loved. Do you remember... Um, do you remember... There in the Old Testament when, when the dad went to bless his son, what was the first thing he did? Before he spoke the words of blessing, he drew him near and hugged him and kissed him. Love your children. And you do that first by touching them. And second, bless your children. Tell your children how special they are. Point out the good in them. Man, children can hurt us. And they can let us down and they can disappoint us. And some are gifted in some areas that may be more familiar or, or that we may enjoy more. But even the others that we don't identify with quite as much, they have their strengths. They have their strong suits. Bless them. Point out the good in them. Paint a good future for them. Man, I know God is going to use you. Man, you are so good at this. I know that God is going to use this in your life. I know that He's going to use you to touch people. Bless your children. Tell them how special they are to you and how special they are to God. And how God has made no one else exactly like them. Love your children. You do that by touching them and by blessing them and by listening to them. Take time to listen to your children. Because the time will come and the day will come when you wish that they would talk to you. If you're like me, often we listen to our children with half an ear. 
hearing what they're saying but not really paying attention. You demonstrate that you love them, that they are important to you. And when you take the time to turn from the TV and face them and respond to what they're saying. Love your children. Touch them. Bless them. Listen to them and pray for them. Oh, The difference it can make in a young person's life. To know that you love them enough. You care about them enough. To pray for them. When they walk in the room. Okay, and here you're praying about that test that they're about to take. The difficulty they're having with that boyfriend or that girlfriend. The people that are giving them a hard time at school, show you love them by praying for them. But not only praying for them, not only do you love them, but you also need to lift them. You need to be your children's greatest cheerleaders. When no one else in the world thinks they'll amount to much, cheer them on. Tell them it's not lost, that there is hope yet. Cheer your children and also limit them. Demonstrate your love for your children by placing limitations on them. And it takes work to limit your children. They need loving boundaries. They need to know that there are certain things that are not acceptable and certain things that will not change. I read a story about a dad who came home from work and found out that his son had lipped off to his mother. The dad heard what he had said and he went to his son and he said, Son, I want you to understand that you have sinned against God in what you said to your mother. For God said to honor your father and your mother and you have not done that. And you will pay a price to God for what you've done. Second, I want you to understand that you have rebelled against your mother by what you have said. Do you not realize the pain that she went to to bring you into this world? Do you not realize the things that she has sacrificed in order to prepare meals for you, in order to make sure that your clothes are ready for school? In order to stay up at night and to make sure your projects are well and to help you to study for school. Do you not realize the sacrifices that she has made on your behalf? You have sinned against God by not honoring your mother. And you have sinned against your mother and shown that you are completely unthankful for what she has done by what you have said to her. You have sinned against God. You have sinned against your mother. And third, I want you to understand that you have sinned against me. Because your mother is the most important person in the world to me. And I will allow nobody to speak to my wife the way that you have spoken to your mother. You have sinned against God and he will hold you accountable. You have sinned against your mother and you will pay a price. And you have sinned against me. And you will pay a price. Parents, dads, Teach your children that there are boundaries. That there are guidelines that they must live by. In 1993, workers doing some moving and remodeling at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Coopertown, New York, discovered something rather unusual. As they were moving the display cabinet, they found an old photograph tucked behind the case. It was a photo of a stocky, friendly looking man in a baseball uniform with the word Sinclair Oil on the shirt. Stapled to the picture was a note in a man's scrawl that said, You were never too tired to play ball. On your days off, you helped build the Little League field. You always came to watch me play. You were a Hall of Fame dad. I wish I could share this moment with you. No one knew how the 
picture got there or the identity of the dad in a photo. A national sports magazine picked up the touching story and a man came forward to say that he had took the picture behind the stand and the note behind the case during a visit to the Hall of Fame. It seems the ball player in the photo was the man's late father. And just like the note said, this man was proud of his dad and believed that he deserved special recognition. So he decided to honor his father by holding his own little ceremony to induct his dad into the Hall of Fame. I want to be that kind of dad. Let's be the kind of fathers and mothers who make it a joy for our children to obey God's command. Honor your father and your mother.